Good evening, everybody. We're about to begin our weekly session of Zoom into Wine. I'm super happy you could be here with us this week. Uh, in fact, we're going to take a little detour a little further uh, to the west, uh, to the, the, the uh, you know, they call it the Far East, but it's way west um, <laughs> from where we sit in Los Angeles. Um, we're going to uh, talk about sake tonight, and there are a few people I know that uh, have incredible passion and, and content about sake, and Eduardo Dingler is joining us tonight. He has an incredible resume and has even lived in, in Japan and all over the world and is a writer for a number of magazines. Eduardo, great to have you on Zoom into Wine. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's quite an honor. And anytime you can uh, invite me to talk sake, I'm completely in and happy to share it. So uh, thrilled to show this three like real gems tonight, which are unique in their own merit. Um, we'll get in depth, but basically we're featuring the creme de la creme, like the, the tete de cuvée, if you will, of the, of the sake world. Uh, and we'll get into why, uh, but mostly because of the grades of the polishing of the, gra of the grain of rice. But also we're going to highlight stylistic differences uh, because of production uh, and also rice strains utilized and regionality, which is a huge, huge part of, uh, and you would say the terroir, what drives the sake in terms of, uh, in terms of differentiality in between styles. So uh, we see it with, with wine very often, and it's easy to put, for instance, three Chardonnays, one from Chablis, one from, uh, I don't know, Australia, and one from California, uh, Sonoma Coast, let's say, and, and try and blind and try to assess the quality, the malolactic, the creaminess, all these things. It gives it a, a clear stamp. Also, uh, oak barrel usage and all these things and climate, but we'd say um, a lot of people scratch, scratch their head a bit and, and trying to figure out what makes all these differences. And it's quite, quite uh, remarkably parallel with wine in, in many ways. So without further ado, uh, if everybody has a glass in front of you, whatever it is, uh, feel free to start enjoying I can talk for hours. And I am, uh, as, as I said, very excited to do this. So uh, first, uh, things first, we're going to start talking about the Hama Fukutsuru, which is a sake from um, the uh, Hyogo region. And Hyogo is on the sort of south central part of Japan. A few things take into effect as far as the uh, stylistic, as I mentioned. The biggest thing is the water. So here we're talking about uh, there's two styles of water. Wow. Sorry, Thank Edward. The... I just screwed that up. Hold on a second. That's awesome. <laughs> I've got a I've got yes. a great slideshow for you that will give you everything that you're looking for, but uh, I just went to the very last slide and and uh, I got to start over. So, give me one second. I'll bring that up. And even a beautiful slide with your face on it. There we go. Can you see that now? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. You do see it. Um, which number are we talking about? I have the tasting. So number I number one. Yeah, we're number gonna start one. with number one and go one, two, three. Okay. And uh, I I know we had them listed a little differently on the website, but uh, we okay. We, yeah. Yeah, just to just, just to throw you off for a loop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're we'll uh, uh, I've got the slides showing you the wine number one and everything. There's some great content here which. We can come back to in just a second, Eduardo. But let me just show the picture of the wine that we of the sake that we're going to start with. So we've got a lot of slides that he will um, potentially scan scan over the top. But here is our first sake this evening. That's the one. This is the Hamafukutsuru. Uh, it's a bizen omachi, which means uh, part of the core of the production is omachi which is the rice strain utilized. So if I can backtrack real quick and I'll talk, I'll incorporate production and all the other slides uh, and then we can share them with everybody at the end. That way at your own time, you can go through them and, and such. But basically 
there's two styles of water that affect tremendously the, the water, uh, the sake at the, at the end. So just like uh, you will in a distillery or a beer brewery, where you are uh, established as a sake brewery, that's the water, the water quality you get. And it's either heavy mineral water or soft mineral water. And very simply, if you're talking about the north, as you can see from Hokkaido all the way to Tohoku and uh, Niigata, all these regions towards the north middle of the country, those areas are driven by a very soft, silky style of water, which gives it a creaminess, very, very elegant, right? In this one in particular that we're starting with, with the Hama Fukutsuru, you're in the south. You are uh, next to Kyoto in the Hyogo region and properly in uh, Kobe, right in the port of Kobe, where all the famous beef comes from. Uh, and the water component here is rich mineral, as you can taste in the palate. It has this beautiful kind of a, uh, if you let it sit in the palate and your tongue for a second, it has a little weight and complexity, which to me is fascinating, right? The way it, it kind of uh, delivers kind of in the, all the quadrants of the tongue. Uh, now there's, that's the biggest difference here with this one in particular. The other two parts are uh, the rice strains, as I mentioned briefly on, in the name is the Omachi rice. And Omachi, it comes from the neighboring little prefecture of Okayama. And Omachi tends to have this focus, rambocious, kind of a lively acidity component to it generally. And this, in this case, is combined with 45% of Yamada Nishiki. Now, those are two of the father rice strains. There's over 200 rice strains, which is like crazy. It's like heirloom grape varieties in Italy. It's like heirloom all over the place. Every region has their own that grows pretty well uh, because of climatic and terroir and, and, uh, and the features that you carry in, in the, each area. But in this case, as you can see there, Omachi, which is draws from the south, as I mentioned, rambocious, elegant, crisp. And Yamada Nishiki, it's, you could say it's the Cabernet Sauvignon, what it is to Napa Valley. It's, it's viewed as elegant. I mean, something that Bordeaux kind of put on the pedestal in, in many places. It's very decisive. It's, uh, it, it's usually utilized across the board. If you were to look generally at what Daiginjo level sake is produced with, Yamada Nishiki would be like the crown king. In this case, by mixing both, and the combination of the water, you get this really beautiful, soft, just a kiss floral, but I wouldn't say sweet, not even too much of a sweet perception. It is linear, little citrus, just elegant. This is a, a sake that kind of delivers a great experience with oysters, with uh, uh, smoked salmon. Uh, I mean, if you're gonna go breakfast, you do like eggs Benedict, things like that with a little bit of fattiness and, and fun. Um, so let me talk about Daiginjo to divert, divert a little bit here. So there's a pyramid of, uh, as I like to see it, of the polishing grades of sake. So today we're just focusing, as I mentioned, on the top part of that of the uh, triangle. So let's think the rice grows in, in any given region and each area kind of has their, their, their preferred rice because of the, the structure and all that. Uh, comes into the brewery as brown rice, just like we buy it at Whole Foods or whatever. So brown rice, and the way you decide and you give the grades of sake, it's by polishing away out of the grain of rice. So in theory, the closest you get to the heart or shimpoku, shimpaku or the rice, it's a little more of the, uh, there you go, that's a perfect example. So the closer you start to get to the heart of the rice, there's a little cloudy area in the middle, the more elegance, the more uh, purity you will find. Not to make the other styles less on the, on the other side of the spectrum, because the difference is purity, elegance, and softness versus a sake with a little more complexity, richness, weight, chewiness in the palate. But as I mentioned today, it's like we're drinking only Krug and Domon and all the Tete Cuvets from each house of Champagne, if you were talking Champagne. And that's what we're focusing on. So um, moving on to the second one. So first we start in the South. We, we have now an example of what 
weight in the palate is, uh, the rice composition, which is not often, uh, not a very popular thing to do in Japan, but this brewery is doing it with, with the majestic technique of incorporating the two rice strains. Next, we're gonna move all the way up into Yamagata. So the second oh, one- to our second sake, is, is that what you're doing there, Eduardo? You wanna to move to sake number two? Indeed. Okay, so you want us to taste yes, all three and then we'll go through the all the knowledge stuff, huh? Yeah, and I'll invite anybody to raise their hand and stop me because once I get going, it's like I'm going on the autobahn and then sometimes it's hard to, to stop me. But if I lose anybody, by yeah. all means, stop me kinda, and we'll, we'll go back on. a little bit into production and all that. The, and you got to hold on for the enlightenment here because he's going to show a couple different styles and then we'll divulge some of the background behind them. But giving, giving you a chance to taste exactly. right away and... Uh, these are really top efforts, so there's so much to absorb here. So I'll, I'll let you continue with sake number two, everybody. Excellent. So next we go to Yamagata Prefecture. This is um, a style that, I mean, once you pour it in the glass, it jumps out. This is not a shy sake in terms of aromatic structure, fruitiness, uh, violets, lilacs, a little bit of jasmine. Oh my God, my mouth waters every time I smell this. So in this case, and Yamagata worth noting, it's the first region in Japan to get a GI or geographic indication for many reasons. But basically it's for the combination of uh, ingredients. The water is super soft here. You have a completely different style. And that's why I love the juxtaposition because it gives you a, a clear example in the palette of soft water that's only achieved with feed and feed and feed of snow every year and all that snow melt just comes down into the brewery and it just very silky rolls through the palate um this brewery the first time i visited was actually uh in february 2020 during my last trip to uh japan and i've been dying to get back there hopefully october will happen but the first time visiting this brewery, it was actually the first brewery we stopped in Yamagata. And to give you a little perception of, of terroir and landscape, when you're going from uh, Tokyo, you take the Shinkansen train. It's about an hour and a half. You stop in Niigata, which is very dear to my heart. And we'll get into the Niigata prefecture next. But from there, you can take two ways. You take a, a road, which is a steep road. I've done that one before a few years back where in a, in a bus or a car, you just go on steep, like little curves, and it's a beautiful landscape, very piney in many ways. And that time I took it in the, in the, on the road was uh, just late spring. So no more, there was snow in the ground, but it was a very fair weather. And um, this last time I went in February, 2020, it was full on winter effect. We took the train and it was like, being in a roller coaster ride where you're going just just going incline 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 and you could just look out the window and it's just the most beautiful romantic landscape with snow like big snow just plowing through all the piney areas and you just go it's about an hour ride and you just go and it gives you this excitement because you're looking out the window uh it, it almost looks like that scene from kill bill when the, they're in the snow outside and it's you're just waiting for us. It. Like at, at what point are we going to stop? You literally just reclined all the way up, and then you get there. And the place where this brewery is is called Goto Shuzo, and it's a father and son team. They started the brewery. The brewery started itself a, a few generations ago in the 1800s. So you get there. It's a little tiny town. We we got to the train station and we walked probably no more than five blocks in the snow, mind you. Um, and you get there and it was fantastic. It was this beautiful dojo kind of structure, very romantic. And you go in, uh, father and son, the mom brought us tea. And the, the way you do in Japan, as opposed to like when you go visit a winery in Europe, or California, wherever it is, it's very uh, ceremonial in steps. So we go in, take your shoes off. We go into this tatami floor with a tiny low table and 
we sit down, we introduce ourselves. You cannot talk business or sake or anything. You just kind of politely start unveiling. And then the mom brings us a little tea, which was perfect for the winter weather. Have a little tea, start chatting. They start showing us pictures and whatnot. And then after the tea, and it, it felt like 30 minutes to 45 minutes of polite introductions and such, then we went into the brewery side. They only have about seven Last time we checked, there was seven employees. Everybody touches each bottle. It is a, a labor of love, handheld. I mean, this is like viewed uh, as far as perception and allocation in Japan. It's kind of like Opus One in that sense, but without the production levels. Pretty tiny. Um, the water we got to taste it from the from the the hose they use. And straight from the mountainside. And that's when it all clicked from, for me. It was just like, wow, just tasting the water uh, straight from the source, giving you that soft, almost glycerin-y kind of component. It, it made all sense. So that combined, long story short, with the rice strain that grows best in Yamagata called Dewa Sansan. 100% Dewa Sansan here. This is like the the one of the most expensive ones to grow because it's very finicky. I kind of compare it to like Pinot Noir or Nebbiolo in, in, in Piemonte or in the coastal areas of California where it, it just loves that perfect weather. You cannot have a lot of uh, heat or cold or rain or anything. So that's what the Wasansan is so highly sought after. So the combination of that with the rice and the yeast strain that's utilized to make this one sake, it gives you that imprint. So this is, as you can see, if you have the bottle on the side of the label, or if you can see my screen, I can show you, it has the GI designation. And as I mentioned, the first one in the country pioneering this style. Uh, from there on, now there's 17, uh, as of two months ago, there was 17 areas that have gotten this stamp. And basically what you have to prove is that your sake is made with all uh, domestic or, or localized components. There you go, that's the one, yeah. Um, and it's also delivering this style. The sake is to get this stamp, need to have the uh, tasting panel, blind tasting panel where everybody tastes and they say, okay, this is uh, Yamagata style. Then they put it on and then it can go out to the world. So, excuse me while I take a sip because I can, my mouth's watering. <laughs> It is kind of the similar this is, um, port with port wine, Eduardo. They do that for, you know, to be able to release a 10 uh, or 20 or 30 year tani, you have to submit the sample and the, the board needs to approve the sample to get the stamp that you can use to make a 10, 20, 30, 40 year tani. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's that level of, of care and service. And, and if it doesn't go through, that's it. You don't go through, right? You have to. And then there's analysis and all these extra things that go through all those bodies, regulatory bodies. But so here in the palate, to me, it's juicy. It has uh, a very uh, signature stamp of Yamagata. It's a, like an anise seed fennel, licorice, a little bit of uh, grapefruit juice, like that juiciness that kind of keeps going and going and going uh, that gets your salivary glands all around. Uh, and I, I'll say, I mean, for this level of sake and the price you have it, I, I got to say it, it's quite low because this one, usually you'll see it on a restaurant list for upwards of $300. There's a places in San Francisco that have it at four or 500 and, and they sell them like hotcakes. Quite uh, fascinating in that style. Another thing to note on this sake, and I'm just like the with the next up. one, this is a Genshu. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, don't do that. No, for this group. But uh, just a side note, um, Genshu, uh, the word you see right there after Junmai Daiginjo means undiluted. So this is uh, the level of care that they're doing with sake like this, where it has Genshu. It's a stamp that 99% of the sake that's produced, it gets a little bit of dilution before it's, it's sent out into the world. The reason, obviously, it's because the alcohol could be a little higher and uh, to make a little yields a little, a little bigger. But in this case, the Genshu is protecting the flavor. It just, that's what's giving it this much power under the hood that's delivering that the big style. So um, 
the word Junmai Dai Ginjo. Let's break that down while we're here. So Junmai, Jun means pure, Mai means rice. So it's pure rice, meaning there's nothing added in here other than the four ingredients that are utilized to make sake. And the quick recap on those is rice, which is the, the main body, gives it a lot of the, the texture and flavors, shape. The water, as we mentioned, could be hard or soft water, giving a little complexity or silkiness as we're tasting right now with this sake. Third one is the yeast. So the yeast varietal, there's a lot of yeast. And yeast, um, although there's a few yeast that are used more often with sake, like 1801, which tends to give this fruity, kind of red apple, plummy component. There's number seven, number nine, which can be a little more, more drier in style. But there's also yeasts that are uh, just living at the, at the brewery uh, and, and kind of give you this different stamp of, of uh, terroir on top of what we talked about. And a quick side story on yeast, which actually made, made me understand better what happened. I'll go on a tangent here, but back a few years ago, I used to run the, the beverage for Chef Morimoto globally. And Chef Morimoto makes a beer with this uh, a beer brewery out of uh, Newport, uh, Oregon called uh, Rogue Brewery. So back in the day, we went to visit uh, this brewery and after a long trek, a uh, couple of small airplanes and we get to the brewery and we're tasting with the president of the brewery bread and the brewmaster, which is this guy that kind of looks like a Fidel Castro, long beer, roll, pretty uh, straightforward brewmaster that's been there for years. We're sitting there in the tasting room of the brewery and we have a couple of beers in front of us and I look up to the sign and it says beard beer. And I stop for a second and I say, hey guys, I've never seen this one out in the wild and never even heard of it. They said, no, no, it's a small project we're doing here at the brewery, but why don't we taste it? But first, let's just taste it and then we can talk about the process and all that. So they bring a sample, we taste it and it's, it's, it's very nice. I mean, I gotta say, it's like nutty, kind of like Newcastle style, a little amber in color, nice beer. I was like, oh, this is pretty good. It should go on to distribution. So then he says, well, I'll tell you what happened. And um, they, were, they have all these hop fields all throughout Western parts of Oregon in which they grow all their hops. And they were trying to isolate yeast to go from their own fields to make beer out of it. So basically what happens is the lab, you can buy a little Ziploc bag with Q-tips inside basically. They send it to you and you go out in a sterile environment and just touch whatever it is. They kept going to the hop fields and going through the plants and sipping it and sending it to the lab. They did that twice. It didn't take. The lab kept saying, whatever you sent us just didn't take. It died on the way there or here, whatever happened, but it's not working out. So the third time, as a joke, they go through John's beard and they grab that Q-tip and put it all through his beard, rub it in, sip it and send it to the lab. And the lab comes back and says, hey, whatever you sent us took. So here it is. You can make whatever alcoholic beverage with it. Basically just eat all the sugars and they did. And it turned out to be the beard beer. So if you see it out in the, in the marketplace, that's what it is. But it really kind of settled to me what you can do. And going through Japan and seeing the applications into sake, it's fascinating because some breweries will do like flower yeast, isolate a certain flower or fruit. So they have, there's a banana yeast sake, there's a strawberry yeast sake, and a lot of those aromatic components are coming straight from the source. So after that rampage on, on, uh, on yeast, we'll go, yeah, questions? I think that was just Good. the machine squeaking. Um, the fourth, oh, go ahead. I have a couple of pictures here from Yamagata of the facility. Uh -huh. Looks Beautiful. Yeah, so in this picture, the first one here, it's they're steaming the rice. So as I mentioned to earlier and alluded to the production, so the rice comes in a, in a, in a brown rice, right? gets the polishing taken away, which is painstakingly long, labor intensive, and also drops your yields. Therefore, Daiginjo level sake, it's 99% of the time more expensive than any other sake because of that, right? 
So then it comes into the brewery. They, it goes through steaming. In this uh, case in particular, in that picture, it's going through the steaming with the little fire under. And then once it's ready to go, almost al dente, I, I would say, then it gets split into two areas. One part of the rice goes into a kojimuro, and I don't remember if you have a picture of it, but basically, no. kojimuro, it's like a sauna room. It's a, a wood covered, typically a room in which the, the rice gets put in small batches, and then on top of it, you sprinkle koji, koji, which is the four. And this took me a long time to understand, so don't feel bad if you don't. Basically, koji is like a mold that go, that's very um, vast throughout Japan and is utilized to make a number of things from miso to soy sauce, shochu, which is Japan's destillate, all these things. And to better understand it, what yeast is doing here, or koji is doing, it's breaking down the starches in the grain of rice so the yeast can convert those starches, those sugars that, is being, that are coming out into alcohol. So to backtrack and put it, comparing it to wine, if you have a, a handful of grapes, right? If you squish them and put them in a container and leave them out, chances are, thanks to nature and, and chemistry and all that, that handle of that handful of grapes are going to turn into alcohol eventually. So the reason is all the sugar and then yeast comes into contact, converts the yeast does its job to eat all the sugars, converts them into alcohol. With rice, we don't have those sugars. So this is why koji is elemental to sake production. So in going back to the little sauna room that I was explaining, they do small batches of the steamed rice and they sprinkle it on top like a little thing of like Parmesan cheese looks like in many cases or a cheesecloth and then they do like a very ceremonial sprinkling. Then picture. they once it's spread through the batch, then it gets wrapped. Oh, there you go. That's the koji making. So they, they put it in these batches and then they wrap it in cheesecloth like a baby in smaller ones and put it away on the sides at a warm temperature, right? In this koji room, very sauna-like temperatures. Put it there to rest. They put a little thermometer towards the middle and just monitor. And then when the temperature gets higher, that's when the koji has started to do its job and starts converting all the starches into sugars. Hmm. So from there, once that you have the koji rice, then you start your additions to make the sake. So you put a little bit of the other, the regular rice, a little bit of the koji rice, water, and uh, the yeast. And then you start making additions. The fermentation period, it lasts from two weeks to a month in which everything just starts working itself and getting the alcohol going. You do about three additions, and then from there you have sake. So with that in mind, let's move on to the next one. Well, we cover other things. Okay. This is by far one of my favorite packagings and something that attracted us to this brewery right away. This is from Niigata. This is Niigata would be considered kind of like the Napa Valley of red wine production, what it is to the US. Uh, Niigata has this mountain range that's called the Eshigo Mountains. And it's high peaks. It's almost like the, the Japanese Alps that cut through the country. This Alps, what they do is they collect record feet of snow every year. And as we know, that converts into very soft water that comes straight to the brewery. This brewery, Imayo Sukasa, is located very near the, the train station. And this guy started brewing in the 1700s. So the legacy that they carry, 16 generations, it's impressive. Um, you might say, well, this packaging is pretty avant-garde. And it is. It sure is. It's the team that took it over in the last generation. It's a very young team. These guys are in their 30s. And they are focused in innovation and also paying a little homage to the past. But the packaging and the sake, it's, it's definitely their, their big calling card. So in this one in particular, you have... 
I drew my Daiginjo, also Genshu, so keep that in mind. Now you're doing two Genshus, and if you have multiple glasses, you can do them side by side and see the differences. And note that a wine glass is, it's pretty ideal to, to drink this level of sake. There are some sakes that are uh, better, sometimes enjoyed in a, in, in a nochoco or in a ceramic little cup, which is a very romantic way of doing it. But when you're at this level of aromatics, and textures, the way that you can really extract the most out of a sake like this is through a wine glass. So you swirl a little bit, just like wine. The aromas just really jump out. And the other thing is if you're comparing a ceramic or choco to a wine glass is the way it hits your palate. And this is something that I learned from Ro George Riedel um, in a couple seminars. And uh, I've always thought about it when, when tasting whether it's wine or sake or any other beverage, the way that the thick or thin of the glass hits your palate, it opens up through, through the sides of your mouth. So you get the full expansion of it, as opposed to when you're drinking out of a, an Ochoco, it's a completely different experience. So it's a little more muted in some way, if that makes sense. So in that case, we have a Junmai Daiginjo Genshu from Niigata proper, so the water is even a little more delicate and soft, but this sake, which is made with proprietary rice, which is uh, basically not disclosed, but we got to see it while we visited. It's a uh, Koshtanre, which is another domestic localized uh, sake from our uh, rice train from Niigata. Um, also worth noting, Niigata is the area out of Japan, out of 47 prefectures with the highest number of breweries. There is 90 of them, as opposed to some some areas, only, uh, like some regions or prefectures, only make only have one brewery or three. In this case, it's the highest concentration. It started in the 1600s, where people started identifying uh, the water, the region. Uh, it's very bountiful with, as you could imagine, with seafood and things like that. But also those hillsides, which are ideal for even uh, skiing and snowboarding and all that. Um, and actually, as a side story, I was at, at an event uh, a number of years ago, and I was talking sake and sharing some stuff, and Sean White was there, the Olympic medalist snowboarder. And we were just talking about sake and this and that very casually. And then I said, oh, this one's from Niigata. And he said, no way. He said, I've been going to Niigata since I was like six years old, because that's where my mom would take me to snowboard. So that really put it in perspective. There is a lot of vast areas. Obviously, there's many regions in Japan, but he said his mom found out early on that Niigata had this ideal slopes that gave him all the powder he needed for, for learning early on in his career, which I thought was fascinating. So anyway, talking about the sake, you have the Eshigo Mountain influence, you have a very soft water, a very magical place. And I got to say, I've, I live in Napa Valley and I visit many wineries and whenever I can because of my, my job and, and writing and all that. But sake breweries don't often have the same experience as far as like the education and, and, and just the guest experience. But this guys, I thought it was to the max. When we went, we went into the, the main uh, tasting room and they had an incredible experience all around. They had sake pairings with honey, with local honey, with chocolates, they had actually a sake ice cream that was amazing, uh, just twirling uh, right from the soft serve machine. And then they had a, an amount of, of uh, sake tastings kind of prepared all across the building, which was fascinating to go with their style, their packaging, as I mentioned, and, and just their, their whole culture. Very young, uh, as I mentioned, team, the, from the president to the master sake brewer. And they really just try to have that that connection between the past, but also looking avant-garde into the future and attracting new generations. So something I find uh, pretty interesting is that in Japan currently, there is uh, just less of lower than 1200 breweries in existence and bonded and operated. Back in the eighties, used to be over 3000. So that huge decline What's happened is that the younger generations are looking at other things. They have a um, sake has become a thing for like, it's like, oh, it's my dad's or my grandpa's thing. And I, I hear this from friends from, from Japan all the time. 
is that it's sort of antiquated in many ways. And there's now they're being bombarded with craft cocktails, with natural wine, with you name it, right? A number of other things and alternatives. Now, this is a phenomenon that also happened in Europe. And I don't know if you guys recall, but uh, France, Spain, Italy, they saw something like this. There was a hurdle where all of a sudden wine wasn't cool. It was like my grandpa's thing. And then locally, France and places like that managed to really capture the attention of the younger crowds. And they're, now they're excited and there's all these different innovative things going on. So Japan is a little bit behind in that sense. A lot of the, the breweries are pretty stuck in their ways, but something I found fascinating is that these guys from Imayo Sukasa were really just trying to get everybody intrigued. Some of their other sakes include a, a super dry, it's called black, and it is the driest sake you'll have. It's crisp, has this tension of sincere and a little bit of an earthy component too, like dried shiitake in the back end. So things like that, they're, they're trying to just go out of the, out of the whole realm and keep it pretty exciting. So super fascinating. What do you guys think about the sakis? Do you have some, some, uh, favorites, some, uh, not so favorite. What do you think? I'll let other people speak. If you guys have any comments, please go ahead. I enjoyed them all. But the last one was amazing. Yeah. I like number three. It's amazing. It's very mm -hmm. yeasty. You can taste the yeast. Hmm. Uh-huh. I something I love about number three, and I I, I can't pick one because they're like kids to me. I go and pick them and bring them, but they're so unique. But number three, that the koi, it's certainly one that I, I tend to be very attracted to. I love the texture, how it's like more stern a little weight and now I often get like a little layer of like lemon meringue, little citrus that comes out, very refreshing and stern where the, the Benton is quite aromatic. And as I, as I mentioned in the palate, it's fruity, it's elegant. Uh, and the Hama Fukutsuru is to me a, a great entryway into the category where it's like refreshing, fun uh, and different, but I don't know. It, it all depends. Also depends on what you're eating. So for me, the Benton, the second one, it is an ideal friend for either Indian curry, Thai curry, even Mexican food, like mole, street tacos, things like that are really amazing. And surprisingly, the koi to me is amazing with Italian food. I mean, you can go like a, a pasta, like gnocchi, you can do like a Parmesan or uh, pecorino uh, on the pasta, things like that, and even pizza, where, as I mentioned, the hamafukutsuru, it's a little lighter on its feet, and it plays best with like a, a very fresh kind of a component of citrus and uh, seafood and, and things like that. So that's, that's my experience with them. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning, and it's always very relevant, is the longevity of sake once it's open. So as we know, wine, you can open a bottle and you have on average two days, right? Some a little more sturdy, some less, but one or two days, that's your max. Otherwise it starts seeing the oxidation, getting a, a little bit of vinegary in some way, but sake is very forgiving. Sake, as long as you're keeping it in a cool, ideally refrigerated environment after opening it, you can have a window of three weeks to a month in which is good to go. It's what it's intended to be by the brewery and it doesn't change much. Now, something I'm a huge fan of, it's become a favorite sport of mine and it drives my wife crazy, is I'll keep the bottles in the fridge even longer. I'm talking two, three months. I'll date it in the back, just put it out there and then keep trying it. And every time we do something like we either grill steaks or we do like a seafood pasta or whatever it is, I'll pour it out and I'll like try a little bit with it and desserts and whatever it is that we're doing and keep going back to it. So what happens with sake after that month long uh, aging, again, refrigerated environment, it becomes a little richer, more concentrated. And it's almost like it went to the gym. It's like it starts getting pretty like squared. So something we do that I, uh, a tradition we've done for a few years at my house is 
my wife, once it starts getting cold, like wintry weather, she'll put like a leg of lamb and a bunch of vegetables in a crock pot overnight. And the next day, or favorite thing to do is like Christmas, we'll just go and start opening the oldest bottles of sake that have been opened and pair it with that. Because now that the sake, like if it, especially if it's a sturdy style that already starts with a little bit of like umame and richness, and then you age it for three months, it gets even more. So it's able to tackle down like complexity, gaminess, richness of, of the food. Quite fascinating. Well, what I could do now is uh, go through the educational packet and uh, kind of feed everyone some of the vocabulary and some of the, the techniques and photos or illustrations so that you can better understand. Absolutely. Is that okay? Absolutely. So basically in this map, what you're seeing is the, the Toji guilt or the if you will the the brewmaster schools in japan which is sort of um an a very traditional and antiquated way of looking at it because these days a lot of the young brewers i've met out in the throughout japan they are more of experiential rather than following a school but there's i mean there is a lot of relevance to this each style has their each area has their style based on water and and yeast, as I mentioned, the regionality of there. And then the next one. Um, this is basically like the the symbology or the the kanji in which we we see the sake evolution. Every time you see the last one, the the purplish one in the square, that is. If you see it on any bottle of, of sake and you're wondering, sometimes we get gifts from Japan or anywhere else in the world, even China, because it's the same symbolism. And you don't know if it's going to be, sometimes it's vinegar, sometimes it's something else. But when you see the kanji in the last one, that means it's alcohol. And there's a, a very important um, thing to touch on here. The word sake in Japan means alcohol in general. So. I learned this very early on a decade ago when I started going to Japan is that if you go and sit at a bar and say, I'll take sake, the bartender is just going to look at you funny and say, okay, what do you want? Do you want beer, tequila, whiskey? What do you want? So the word for sake, as we know it here in Japan is called Nihonshu, which means Japanese alcohol. And the reason uh, good or bad, what happened is when it started being exported and introduced into other markets, Europe and the US, the word Nihonshu was very difficult for people. So the sake producers and the marketing people and the people that were starting to bring it out in the 60s, 70s, they thought, well, the word sake means alcohol in Japan. Why don't we just call it sake and try to educate people like that? So it's kind of like a, a conversion there of, of words in which ultimately cost sake not to be able to be protected. Just like we know now, champagne is protected, tequila is protected. You can only make it in certain regions. Sake is not gonna get that, that umbrella because of the word. So now sake is being produced all around the world, right. uh, which is a very good thing if you ask the, the brewers and education and more interest in sake. But there's a, a brewery now in Switzerland, there's one in, in Spain, in Germany, Italy, in the US, we have 22 breweries and growing fast. There's one in Mexico, all over the place. So it's, it's a great expansion into it because get people into it. Um, this was basically the main ingredients uh, of, of sake. And as we mentioned, you have um, the rice being a huge component and water is like the main player here. And then aided by koji and yeast, as we talked about. And the alcohol percentage content is roughly around 16% uh, on average. So for instance, the ones we've tasted today, the uh, two Genshus are 17% and the Hamafukutsuru is 15%. So a little less and you can feel it in the palate, um, but that is pretty much in par what it is. Some reach all the way to 22 and just be careful, some Genshus in particular, that's what it hits you. And it's very easy to, I learned very early on to it to drink a whole bottle and then you're not able to get up afterwards. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lesson learned. 
Um, this is basically the measurements of, of sake. So it all started actually with the little masu boxes, this little um, cedar box, as you can see here, that you've probably come across at your local sushi place or whatnot. Basically, every uh, worker back a few hundred centuries ago used to have one of these boxes. They would go to work and their salary consisted of one of these boxes full of rice. So every employee would get the rice. They would get home, put the rice down in the kitchen. The wife would wash it and start cooking it. And with the same box, this worker would go to their local watering hole and get a go, which is a whole cup of these. It's 180 mLs into the, the wood box, drink it, and then get back home for dinner and then rinse and repeat the next day. So one of those, four of these goes is a 720 bottle. And then also the 1.8 liter bottles, which we see here, this is 10 pours basically of one of those. And that's where all the, the, the sizes stem from. Here's basically like the glassware uh, breakdown. There's the master box, as we were saying, the glass, the ochoco, which is a very traditional. And if you end up in a very traditional um, setting with either Japanese friends or you go to Japan, uh, the trick here is you cannot pour your own. You always keep pouring for everybody in the table. And it, to me, it really encapsulates the culture in Japan because they're little. You have like ounce and a half, maybe two in some cases, and everybody's drinking and you're constantly watching for your neighbor, which is, is to me one of my favorite things. There's always an interaction and you cannot pour your own. So just keep that in mind. Uh, here we go to the, the process in which we covered earlier. Um, the polishing, washing, steaming, the koji making in which they're in the koji muro, the storage pressing and mashing and then, or going backwards with the starter and, and the, the storage. There's also um, two pows, two part pasteurization process with sake. One of them is right after the pressing before storage, as you can see in the second to last. And then another time it gets pasteurized before shipping out into the world. That's like a rule of thumb. You will see some, some examples of sake that are unpasteurized and they're fresh, vibrant, elegant. Those are called nama. N-A-M-A. -A. And basically here we have the, the polishing progression, as I was mentioning, how you're taking out of the grain of rice and getting closer to the heart, which provides what we just tasted, definitely a, a very elevated example, but also painstakingly labor extensive. It's about three days to get to the polishing grade 50% and plus. And Therefore, it's lowering the yields as well and making it more expensive. And so when we call the wine or the sake Junmai Daginju, uh, we are talking about a polish that's between basically... Beyond 50%. Beyond 50%. Yeah, by law, Daiginju can, has to be at least 50%. I know the uh, Hamafukutsuru that we tasted first, that's at 35% remaining. So that's pushing it a little more. And there are some crazy examples out there. If you want to spend $2,000 in a one bottle of sake that are 1%, 5%, 10%, and you start just getting a little minuscule amount of just the protein of the center of the rice. And there is people that, that do it because there's people that want to consume it and, and they want to uh, see what it's like and enjoy it. and and show off. And the and the difference between the top three names and the bottom three names is that the top three very important. So yeah. Junmai, Junmai Ginjo, Junmai Dai Ginjo, it's the three levels of polishing. And again, as we broke down earlier, the word Junmai means pure rice. Now, if you don't see the word Junmai, like the bottle part, bottom part, there's Honjozo, Ginjo, and Dai Ginjo. What this means is that there's been an introduction of brewer's alcohol. So this process, what happens is unlike sherry, so sherry production, you add alcohol to stop the fermentation, right? In this case, you actually make a batch of sake, end up with this much, and then you add a little bit of alcohol, and then you water it down. 
And what that does, it really gets all the aromas volatile and the, the palate is sharp, very focused and, and very um, elevated, kind of like a very um, flashy Instagram filter, if you will. And that style, uh, as I mentioned, Honjoso Ginjo or Dai Ginjo, it's not better or worse. It's just a different style. I, I actually, on my day-to-day -day sakes, like everyday stuff, I tend to drink a lot of Honjoso because I love that kind of elevated, lifted aromatics and the crispiness in the palate. When you have Junmais, as we tasted with these three, these were great examples. There's a little more viscosity, creaminess in the palate. Okay, so the first one is, the first sake that we had today is actually a Daiginjo, and, and it, this one had uh, brewer's alcohol added? Yes, so there is a small amount of brewer's alcohol added in there to, uh, as I mentioned, to kind of elevate the palate, make it a little more crisp, and if you have it still open, you can go back to it and see the difference. And the alcohol at the end, it's basically just in line. And as I even actually um, marked the, uh, in this case, the Daiginjo that we tasted the first one, it's lower alcohol content than the others yeah. because of the Genshu component too. So the alcohol gets watered down and it just kind of elevates all those aromas. Hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very clear example of that. Just kind of like goes sharp into that. Then this is basically the, the, the process in which we were talking about of breaking down the starch into sugars, thanks to Koji playing a big role here. And then the yeast eating all those sugars and making them into an alcohol party. Uh, and this one's a, a great representation of all the styles and why the stocks are so different and, and hard to find. So koshi hikari, which is a very popular style for eating rice, table rice, it's a short grain. And basically it's easier to grow in many levels. Actually here in the Delta near Sacramento, we have uh, a lot of rice fields and they focus on, on koshi hikari uh, strains where as you start getting into the more uh, father rices, if you will, Yamada Nishiki being one of them, as I mentioned earlier, it's a high stock and it usually breaks really easy if there's weather patterns. So in this case, uh, areas like Hyogo, uh, near Kobe and all these areas are kind of shielded with, mount, with hillsides and mountain ranges that cover that from the, from the weather. And it just makes it ideal to grow. There is, just like we see with Burgundy and Bordeaux, there's hail and there's different weather systems that will decimate a whole field in this, in this case. That's why uh, Yamada Nishiki, uh, tends to be one of the most expensive and sought after as well. And then uh, basically here we're looking at, at like the differences into what's, what's in the grain of rice. So all the brand that you're taking out, uh, out of the, on the outer layers, it becomes um, actually highly used in many uh, breweries. They use that to feed uh, cows and cattle and, and pigs and all these things, but also they make amazing cookies that and um, Nambu, Nambu, um, Nambuzen they're called and they're quite popular when you go now to breweries, they'll serve you that just like when you go to a, a winery and they give you crackers and, and, and other little snacks like that with the wine to cleanse the palate. In Japan, it's very popular to have those with, with sake to cleanse the palate, very delicious. And then, as we mentioned, this is the diluted style versus undiluted, as we tasted with the last two examples, a little more density, concentration, power, like beautiful kind of difference to it. Although adding the water, it, it just makes for a, a more easy drinking style. Uh, then the sake kazu, which as I was mentioning too, and some of the byproducts of, of the uh, sake production. So casu is actually the lease as well. So once you uh, go through the fermentation, you go through a filtration process in which you extract all the juice, all the sake out of the, 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 the mash, right? So all this uh, lees that are suspended, kind of like the creamy components, they make amazing uh, sake, you can cook with them, 
But most importantly, something that's not mentioned in here has become a craze across Japan and out into the world is uh, makeup and cosmetics. Hmm. There's all money behind it. And one of the proofs, which is really fascinating, is that brewmasters and people that work with sake with their hands and stuff as they're making it have the softest hands. And then they start realizing, wait a second, these guys have like baby hands. They have no cows and nothing. They're just soft. And that started a whole craze on cosmetics. And there's a lot of science behind it, how all these elements that are the second process of, of making sake kind of aid a lot to the skin. So very expensive. And a lot of breweries are really capitalizing on that, rightfully so. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I don't use them, but I see everybody else that uses them around me and it, they're really, really work. And then as we mentioned, like the uh, filtering process. So you go through the pressing and there's three different press styles. There's a fune, which is like a, a wood box in which you put a big bag with the mash and you press it almost like you're making tortillas and then the juice comes out on the side. There is a kubota, a kubota press, which is mechanized and you put the bags in there and then you just press the button and slowly it starts pushing out that. The other method is called shizuku in which is a, a tea bag, if you will, in which you hang from the ceiling and just let it drip. There is no pressure added. It creates a very elegant, soft style with that, obviously a very, very low yield as well to go with that. And then origami is when there's sediment uh, left in there in, on purpose, suspended. So it creates kind of like a, a, a secondary fermentation as well. And then muroka is when they skip the charcoal filtration. It, most of the sake goes through just like we do at the Brita filter in the house. The charcoal takes a lot of the impurities. Most of the sake goes through that. When you see the word muroka, means that they skip the process. So you will see some coloration and you will see a little extra flavor in the sake as well. Almost there, just a couple more. Yes. <laughs> so this is basically like the levels of uh, pressing and, and that you'll see. So uh, Arabashiri, is basically like a first press um, where it has a little bit of like that, that extra pieces in there and a little bit of uh, a texture. Mm -hmm. And then the nakadori gets like the, almost like uh, in distillation, you have heads and tails and what's in between is what you want. This is like the, the creme of the creme or like with champagne presses as well. You want the middle, the heart of it. And then the semi is, is at the end where it has a little more of the concentration and structure. This is like beyond advanced, something you don't utilize that's never disclosed with sake. So keep it and put it in there, maybe store it in the back of your head, but you'll, you won't see it on a wine list or a label. This is very deep into the rabbit hole. Okay. And then here kind of like this rounds it up and puts it into effect. The actual uh, water component when we drink sparkling water or mineral waters, how you kind of gauge it. And I'm a fanatic of sparkling water. I keep about four different brands in the fridge at all times. And it's, it's fascinating when you start getting into the styles. I think if you've had Topo Chico, Topo Chico lays on the higher end of the spectrum, close to 1500. There, and the other ones are a little softer. So this kind of puts in, a, in effect the, the softness of the waters of certain regions. Got it. And then here we're talking about what I, I alluded to earlier, the pasteurization process in which you have the Nama on the top, fully Nama. If you buy a bottle of Nama at the store, uh, at your retailer or whatever, make sure it's always refrigerated. It doesn't sit in the car. It doesn't sit anywhere out until you consume it. Just always, because it, it's got to be protected. Then there's a namachozo, which is a one-time pasteurization before shipping, and namazume, which is one time before bottling or after uh, pressing. And then the nakahide, which is the actual full-on what you see in the marketplace all the time, unless noted, fully pasteurized and protected. And then, 
sake is one of the only beverages in the world that you have a whole range of temperatures. Now, worth noting in this level that we're tasting right now with the Juma Daiginjo's elevated higher uh, styles of, of sake making, you always want to drink those cold out of the fridge. Let it warm up in the glass a little bit. And actually, if you still have some left, you can see how it becomes a little more aromatic, a little more richer, but it's as a rule of thumb, perfect with any sake when in doubt, start it out of the fridge. But some stack, sakes that are a little more robust and rich tend to be beautiful once heated. Uh, and it's something like in the winter in Japan, you'll see all across the board with those styles. Obviously, you're not gonna go spend $500 in a bottle of sake and heat it because at that point you're hiding some of the beauty and killing the floral component. But if you're starting with a very earthy mushroom umami driven sake, you can, it lends itself to, to, get up, to drink it at a different, different level, very ethereal. Wow, thank you very much. This is our final slide. Awesome, yeah, so this one's kind of, when you start getting into what's available seasonal, if you have a dedicated sake store or online, maybe Ian, we'll get you into this eventually. So you have the different seasons and sakes that come with it. So Hiroshi, for instance, comes around Halloween. It tends to have a little more of a, a nutty component. Shibori Tate is very fresh. It's right when the, the uh, brewing starts in a, around the October area. Haruzake tends to have a little more of a, a floral component and Natsu, Natsuzai tends to be a little more of a, a refreshing style to be consumed in summer. Quite fascinating, but super fun. I mean, the world of sake, there's, there's many, many rabbit holes you can get into. Um, super happy to share them. If you uh, have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at sake drinker. That's my Instagram, probably the easiest way to get a hold of me or eduardo at sake drinker.com. But if not, we'll do one more of these or, or many of them, if we can get Ian to, to uh, invite us back, but it was super fun. I hope you guys enjoyed the whole presentation and roller coaster and hearing me talk for a bit. Well, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Just so you guys know where you can find these sakis, if you go to the Zoom and the Wine page, you can see them. We did start with them in this order. We went one, two, three today. Um, and a lot of you made big comments about this uh, third sake, which has been uh, our best seller, actually. I, th I think people are looking for this packaging. It's really cool packaging. But um, as uh, Eduardo was saying, this, this, this one has kind of a cult uh, level of following. And this is a new one for our store. So we'll know uh, how this one does here. But uh, last year we... We tried different sake, and this year we're trying some uh, things that have just arrived. So I was really taken by the packaging here, and I really love the product. All of all three mm -hmm. of them are beautiful, um, and you can always find them even just by going to our website. Um, if you can't find the Zoom into Wine page for any reason, um, you can always uh, just go to the page here and go to the the search button and type in sake and uh, that's how you can find things in a hurry on our, our website that's what i do all the time as well i also still carry this this uh, sake as well from you um, eduardo mm -hmm. <laughs> there it is yeah there's uh the hirai that you see on the top uh left is a beautiful everyday drinking sake has this beautiful beautiful richness uh it, it's become one of my go-tos every day and actually outstanding with like a hamburger or even barbecue pretty pretty flexible with a, a variety of food but a real pleasure being with all of you i'm gonna head out the kids are waiting and um i'm looking forward to continuing the conversation feel free to reach out and um we can talk sake anytime Thank you, my friend. Thank you, so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Cheers. Thanks, Eduardo. Cheers. On our calendar of upcoming activities, um, we have some really fun things, and I've got everything listed on the Learn About Wine website, whether it's our Zooms that we're doing for Merchant of Wine or our live activities that we now have, um, mostly dinners, 
Uh, it takes a long time to build those large outside events. Uh, we are aiming for our first one uh, in November. We're going to be at the Peterson Automotive Museum. The date will be announced uh, fairly soon. But uh, we're building a pretty spectacular uh, kind of one-off event for us for this, for this year. But we're going to continue with dinners on Thursdays. Our next one that's coming up is next week, the Pinot Noir dinner. It's at Tess Restaurant. There's an amazing menu that you can look at with 20 different wines that we're going to taste with dinner. We do serve all the wines blind. We tell you what the four are going to be, but there's always going to be something from Oregon in the flight, something from Santa Barbara, something from Russian River, and just see if, which one you like the best, and then we'll unveil them. And a lot of the winemakers are actually going to be there now. So uh, we've got a great host of winemakers coming to the tasting to uh, educate us and let us know about their product. Um, it's a multi-course menu. It's $2.59. There is a, now a two for deal. So if you're a couple, it's two for 500. And that's an all-inclusive amount. And here are all the different wines that we'll be tasting. It's next Thursday, the 21st. Also new on the calendar is our dinner that we're going to be doing with uh, uh, Sal Marino on August 4th. And uh, a couple really amazing Zooms that we have left for this month, um, including the Stars of Pino Zoom, which showcases totally different Pinots than, than we'll be at the dinner. We'll have six great Pinot Noirs on uh, our virtual Stars of Pino sending out tasting kits. I think that's still 49 bucks to get involved there. So um, that price goes up on Saturday and the event is next Wednesday. Um, we'll finish the month of July with a really special presentation, Leading Women in Wine. I've got Dr. Laura Katana and Nicole Rollet from Shen Blue and they are uh, friends and have uh, met up at different world conferences. Nicole uh, used to work for the Rockefeller Foundation, Foundation and her uh, kind of byline is that she went from think tanks to wine tanks. And if you've ever been on a Zoom with us with Shen Blue wines being poured, they are breathtakingly good wines. Her and her husband left the international marketplace to turn up this amazing old property in the Rhone Valley into a biodynamic resort. And then Laura, Dr. Dr. Laura Catana, uh, her family and she run the Catana Winery in Argentina. And there is barely a grape that they don't want to try to master. And we're trying something really new from them, a wine called White Clay. It's only $15 to join and get the taste of flight kit. Um, the bottle kit, it's only 62 bucks. Maybe grab a bottle kit. Um, get a bottle of each. They're both beautiful wines and uh, I think you'll really enjoy the conversation with these two brilliant women in wine. That's our presentation for tonight. My name is Ian Blackburn. This has been Zoom into Wine. Thank you all. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Bye now. See you soon.